Before we get started, this video was actually a request by one of the wonderful subscribe star bros. In all honesty, I've been putting this one off for a bit now. For good reason too, but you'll find out that in the video itself. All you have to know is that this is one of the dumbest shows I have seen in a while. One that kind of borders into just almost feeling like it's bad on purpose. It was just a little while past the sunset strip I found the girl's body in an open pit Her mouth was sewn shut but her eyes were still wide Gazing through the fog to the other side They booked me on a whim and threw me deep in jail With no bail, sitting silent on a rusted pail Just gazing at the marks on the opposite wall Remembering the music of my lover's call I got a nose for white supremacy and he smells like bleach Yeah, Watchmen, specifically the 2019 HBO miniseries based on the graphic novel. So to talk about Watchmen is to delve into a pretty deep rabbit hole, one that I actively want to shield away from, but for a reason I want to divulge later. Just know that Watchmen, the show, is based off the critically acclaimed comic series by Alan Moore. The basic concept is a deconstruction of superhero stories and fiction, placing superheroes in a much more grounded, bitter version of the world, exploring themes like depression, nuclear war, global politics, and asking at what point does a hero become a villain. Watchmen is one of the superhero stories out there, gaining incredible amounts of prestige in the comics industry and cementing Alan Moore as one of the all-time greats. It even went on to inspire countless derivatives that all want to take their own pot shots at the comic industry and superhero stories. Some famous examples are Kick-Ass, Brad Pack, and The Boys, all of which have some very clear Watchmen DNA in them and how they demystify superheroes and try to show what would happen if Cape Crusaders tried to survive in the real world or just a more nihilistic and bitter look instead of lighthearted superhero fare. Watchmen has gotten so popular, in fact, that it's sort of indirectly responsible for superhero deconstruction to become more popular than standard superhero fare, and it's caused the public to become annoyed and kind of want to go back to dumb fun cape shit. Watchmen worked because it was the exception to the rule. It stood out because it was different from the regular dime stories you'd get from Marvel, but if everything tries to be Watchmen, then what makes Watchmen interesting is diluted. It can lead to people resenting it on principle and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And stuff like HBO Watchmen only fuels this issue. Because holy shit, this is everything Watchmen could have become in a bad timeline. In fact, to some people, they see no real difference between it and the comic. Preachy, up its own ass, and downright contradictory to its own concept and world logic. Now what I'm saying isn't anything special. This show was ripped apart when it came out in 2019. For good reason, because people saw that it was a flaky adaptation to a beloved graphic novel. Sure, the critics loved it, but anyone else who was even slightly honest admitted that it was a fucking piece of shit. But noticeably, a lot of people only covered the first episode and dropped it from there. Which is legitimate, I think. They gave the show an episode to win them over, and it failed. Already showing extreme flaws from the pilot alone. And I do mean extreme flaws. Yet you also had the opposite issue, with people praising the series to high heaven and praising every single aspect to it. I repeat, the journalists seemed to love it. Some even outright claiming it to be one of the greatest television series of all time which is extremely funny in retrospect because this died after a single season and has long since been forgotten. It's drowned in the endless abyss of current thing. Sure, if it comes back in the headlines, people will spam tenor gifts and go, best show ever made, but nobody quotes HBO Watchmen, nobody references it, nobody brings it up again. It died a silent death, forgotten. Because in reality, everyone knew this was a dumbass show. No, actually worse than just being dumb, this is one of the most lazy, resentful, and spoiled shows I've seen. Taking advantage of people with genuine talent to tell a story so poorly thought out, they couldn't even properly explain its own fucking thesis statement. That's not even a joke, but to explain everything, we need some context. So the original story of Watchmen goes as follows. It's 1980s New York and an alternate timeline where the Cold War is about to hit its peak thanks to America winning the war with Vietnam. Out of nowhere, a retired superhero known as the Comedian is murdered in his apartment. The only one willing to investigate it is Rorschach, a mass vigilante who thinks it's a sign of a larger conspiracy against superheroes at large. His investigation brings the retired heroes together to figure out the truth, and they uncover a horrifying conspiracy that ends with the deaths of millions. It's a character-focused story that delves into the history and psychology of each character. You see their perspectives, and see a collection of various ideals colliding together. 
You have characters like Night Owl, who works as an everyman that embodies the average Joe enjoying his retirement. He doesn't really see the bigger picture, and is kind of just shocked when every revelation happens. He contrasts with Rorschach, a mentally deranged vigilante that's obsessed with punishing criminals, who's so paranoid and bitter he's not really surprised by anything that happens anymore. So Spectre doesn't really know what she wants as she's simply continuing her mother's legacy, but knows that something is going on. And her relationship with Dr. Manhattan, a godlike figure losing touch with his humanity and devolving into an emotionless husk of his former self, is important enough for them to be watched by the government every second of their lives. And the only one with even a modicum of real success is Ozymandias, a guy who sold his story and has dedicated the rest of his life to philanthropy. The characters are very human, and there's a lot of emphasis on building a flawed cast that want to be heroic, but their issues simply get in the way, and they end up getting roped into a nightmarish plot to save the world. Alan Moore took a lot of time to get you to understand each member of the cast, and it's led to some of the most profound and interesting monologues in comics. People quote Rorschach's journal entries to this very day, not to mention Dr. Manhattan's speech when he goes to Mars. There's just a good snap to the dialogue. It feels poetic without ever really crossing the line into being ham-fisted. What the hell happened to us? What happened to the American dream? What happened to the American dream? It came true! You're looking at it. Okay, I say that. Just know that it's Alan Moore. There's gonna be ham-fisted shit all over the place, but Watchmen is one of the better examples where it can still kind of work. You can assess the personality of each character by the way they talk, which is a very big praise for the story, not even mentioning all the reincorporation. Because of its emphasis on fears of nuclear war, you have a running motif with clocks, emphasizing watches, the original superhero team was called the Minutemen, and of course, talking about the Doomsday Clock. Actually, the original name of the crime team in the graphic novel is the Crime Busters. Um, the Minutemen uh, were only named that in the film adaptation, which is just proof that Zack Snyder somehow understood the story better than Alan Moore. But lowly, we'll talk about that later. An actual thing pushed in Cold War media as a way to track the possibility of nuclear war. Once the clock hit midnight, that was it. Kaboom. Not even mentioning the fact that it ties into the title of the goddamn story, with the classic phrase, Who Watches the Watchmen? And that's just the most obvious one. There's a ton of detail to Watchmen, stuff that fans discuss to this very day. It was then adapted in 2009 by Zack Snyder. Now, I have some serious issues with Zack Snyder. A lot of issues. I might have sent some death threats to the man and called his house in the middle of the night so he can hear me breathing over the phone, so he knows I'm always watching him. The point is, I don't really like his movies. But even I have to admit, he did a pretty great job with Watchmen. Granted, this comes with some conditions. Watch the ultimate cut, the four hour long one, because that's the closest you can get to a page by page adaptation to the story, which even then doesn't cover everything. It even includes the tale of the Black Freighter in the movie, which was a spin-off that worked as a sort of allegory to Watchmen, which covered various things like maybe Ozymandias' perspective or Rorschach. There's a lot of interpretation in the tale of the Black Freighter. However, even with the flawed theatrical version, it ended up having a major impact on the public. It introduced the public to Watchmen and sparked a revival in the graphic novel's popularity. And Zack Snyder, along with David fucking Hader who wrote the script, yes, Solid Snake wrote the script to the Watchmen movie, seemed to actually understand what made the story interesting to people. Showing a bleaker, tired version of America, you see dirty streets full of criminals and thugs. There's a melancholy that is prominent throughout the film. The lighting is bleak, there's constant rain pouring down, and the violence is grisly. Jackie Earl Haley was pitch-perfect casting for Rorschach, and it's easily his most famous role by fucking far. Rorschach in general is such an iconic character from the series. Sure, you have Dr. Manhattan, who is equally famous, but the public connected with Rorschach above and beyond the rest of the cast. Sure, he's a violent anti-hero, but he's willing to stare evil in the eye without a second thought. Something that actually pissed off Alan Moore, something awful. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. And the reason for that is because he wrote Rorschach as a bad guy. Sort of. Alan Moore based Rorschach off another DC character known as The Question, or Mr. A. Another hyper-paranoid crime fighter in a trench coat that had a very strong sense of right and wrong. The Question was created by Steve Ditko, an avowed right-winger who held an objectivist mindset, essentially every single thing that Alan Moore despises. Because Moore is an anarcho-communist that thinks he's an actual wizard. No, I'm not kidding, he also worships the snake god. Alan Moore is weird, he also thinks he talked to John Constantine. So he intended Rorschach to be a parody of The Question, who was openly a right-wing character that investigated political corruption and things of that nature. Moore took the character and pushed him to the nth degree. Now he isn't just skeptical, he's full-blown mentally unstable paranoid. He isn't just an objectivist, he's psychotic and will execute or torture criminals. Men get arrested. Blocks get put down.
He's meant to be a parody, but the world Watchmen sets up allows for a character like Roshock to make sense. The world's already so crazy and violent that Roshock being crazy and violent works. You can't really point to him being any worse than the thugs he murders or the corrupt cop he beats the shit out of. Moore tries to paint him as a villain, blatantly making Roshock bigoted towards minority groups, but you only ever see him target the worst of the worst. Human traffickers, child abusers, absolute scum of the earth no one cares about and do deserve judgment. He also excuses the comedian's attempted rape of Silk Spectre's mother, saying it was a moral lapse, a clear hypocrisy to his black and white mindset due to personal bias. Who cares if this guy is racist, supposedly? He's willing to light a man who murdered a little girl on fire, or if you watch the movie, chops his head open with a meat cleaver. And it especially has darker implications when you consider the ending. Now, this is the part where I feel weird even trying to put up a spoiler warning, because everyone knows the ending of Watchmen, the twist, the evil plan, and what happens to Roshock. Regardless, this is going to cover both the comic and the show, because I sincerely do not give a fuck about hiding spoilers for HBO Watchmen. It barely has a story to spoil in the first place. Like, holy fuck. Still, the ending of Watchmen is that you discover Ozymandias, the hero who sold his story, believes he can end the Cold War by launching a false flag attack on America, teleporting a psychic squid monster in the middle of New York City, and having it kill millions of people. The supposed arrival of alien life terrifies the world enough to drop political rivalries and team up to fight the common threat, giant squids. All fairness, it's a reference to a statement made by Ronald Reagan where he mentioned that the only thing that would unite people is if aliens invaded the world. So it's a satirical jab that also works as a dark twist on a lot of the silly villains that would show up in classic comics. It's a little goofy, not even gonna lie, and this is a case where I actually prefer the film version, where it changes it to where Ozymandias set up energy relays in every major city that mimics Dr. Manhattan's energy. It makes it seem like he attacked the world to punish them for flirting with nuclear war. I actually like this a lot more, as the story constantly mentions Dr. Manhattan's power and the fear normal humans have for him. It's taking this quiet element and blowing it up to be the main source of conflict at the end. The energy blasts even look similar to nuclear bombs going off, once again playing into the hysteria over nuclear war that the story pushes, and reinforces the idea that Ozymandias is a madman. He nuked the world to prevent them from nuking the world. Now the world set its sights on Dr. Manhattan and treats him as the threat to fight, and he leaves the planet to create life on his own in another galaxy content that the world will forever view him as a threat in order to build a utopia. But before he leaves, he has to tie up the last loose end, Roshock. He is disgusted by Ozymandias' plan and is dedicated to exposing the truth to the world, putting the chance of utopia at risk. So Dr. Manhattan murders him, the rest of the heroes reluctantly keeping their dark secret for what could possibly be the greater good. Except Roshock knew there was a chance he could die, and made sure his journal was sent to a newspaper before leaving for the final confrontation at Ozymandias' compound in Antarctica. Yes, the heroes conspired to hide the truth about millions of deaths. It's a bleak ending to a bleak story. And I repeat, the guy who wanted to expose the truth about what killed millions of people in New York is painted as a crackpot that didn't get the bigger picture. Alan Moore would seriously have you believe that the plot Ozymandias comes up with is a form of a necessary evil. To prevent nuclear war, he had to come up with a tragedy that would unite the world. There is a lot that is wrong about this mindset, but that is the point Watchmen wants to push. And ironically, Roshock became as beloved as he did specifically for bucking against it, because he refused to budge in the face of intimidation, guilt tripping, and then straight up being assassinated. Roshock having such steadfast principles that he was willing to die to avenge the murders that Ozymandias committed. And I seriously cannot stress this enough. This was completely unintentional by Alan Moore. He wanted Roshock to be a psychotic version of Steve Ditko's character Mr. A, who was admittedly a political mouthpiece for Ditko. He was a character that embodied objectivism and was used to explain the mindset, essentially saying that morality is objective. There is the right thing to do and the wrong. Alan Moore, being a far-left anarchist, took extreme issue with this and basically wrote Watchmen as a fuck you to the guy and to Ronald Reagan. Somebody had been interviewing Ditko and had said, uh... Have you ever heard of this book, Watchmen? And he said, uh, what, what's that? And I said, well, it's got this character in called Rorschach. And he said, oh, yes, Rorschach. He's like Mr. A, except he's insane. <laughs> <laughs> showing a situation where heroes compromise on their personal morality in order to perform a greater good. The problem is that the situation paints Roshock as the underdog fighting against powerful sociopathic entities. Ozymandias believes that he was the hero even as he slaughtered millions. They try to make a point that he feels guilty, he's upset at what he's done, except that doesn't make up for the fact that he wasn't the one wiped off the face of the earth. He was the one that has to carry the burden of killing millions and getting away with it, basically. And Dr. Manhattan is just a full-blown emotionless machine. 
to the point that he needed to be convinced to help mankind, despite the entire conflict kicking off because he didn't care. So you have two ultra-powerful, apathetic beings that decide to use the deaths of countless civilians to push their utopia. It's wrong, and undeniably disgusting. Roshok is the scrappy anti-hero, a homeless man that is the only true believer in justice, in punishing the wicked and protecting the innocent. He's willing to stare a god in the face and say, do it, you fucking coward, to prove his point. Being distracted by Roshok's political opinions is proof that you're willing to ignore reality if it came from an inconvenient source. And the more time goes by, the worse the politics of the story age. But I'll get into that later. I really need to bring up how the HBO show is involved in all of this. Now, the comic itself is a self-contained story. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Only recently have there been attempts to connect it to a larger DC canon, and most everybody agrees that it should really stay in its own bubble because anything else sort of pisses on major elements of the story and makes the already flawed morality debate even more cartoonish. But it was announced that it would receive a new adaptation for HBO that had Damon Lindelof at the helm, the guy who was involved with Lost and Prometheus. So we either think this guy's an underappreciated genius or a fart-huffing hack. No middle ground. And from the word go, the idea of a new Watchmen series just felt off. For one, Watchmen is an undeniably 80s story. It's all about the Cold War and specifically was written in response to Ronald Reagan being more aggressive towards the Soviet Union, since there was legitimate fear it could spark nuclear war. Hell, Moore wanted to outright make the president in Watchmen Reagan, but felt that was too topical, and could piss off readers that might have supported Reagan. So he went the alt-history route with Nixon winning up to five terms as president, because Nixon's able to successfully assassinate the Watergate reporters, win the Vietnam War, and solve the Iranian hostage crisis, meaning that Nixon was never forced out of office, and even pushed for the repeal of the 22nd Amendment, established presidential term limits. If it isn't clear that Nixon is more straw man for politicians he doesn't like, yeah, there you go. Now the thing is, the history it pitches is interesting, but it's a very simplified version of Cold War history that ignores a lot of elements and factors, such as Soviet infiltration, media perception thanks to said infiltration, the head of MI6 was eventually outed as a Soviet spy, I'm not fucking kidding, Soviet infiltration was a very real thing. Now Sir Roger Hollis was never officially proven to be a spy for the Soviet Union. Margaret Thatcher in particular defended him. But the novel Spy Catcher by Peter Wright asserts that the incompetence by MI5 to track down the Cambridge Five, the Soviet spy ring that Kim Philby was tied to, that plagued British intelligence for decades, was intentional, as Roger Hollis was running defense for fellow double agents. And really, the harsh reality that the state of the Soviet Union wasn't as good as what we thought it was. This is what I mean by the politics not aging the best in Watchmen, because it relies on the 1980s view of the Cold War, that the USSR was an equal opponent that could take on the West if they wanted to in a stand-up fight. Which, as it turns out, was bullshit. Reagan's aggressive tactics caused an economic disaster for the Soviets. They got the absolute worst fucking end of the stick. So between the economic damage caused by Reagan and social unrest that was building, the USSR just collapsed. And honestly, what makes the emphasis on saving the world that the comic pushes all the more... laughable? The situation wasn't anywhere near as dire as what Alan Moore wanted to convince you it was, even with the alternate history, because remember, Nixon's just an allegory for Reagan. It was a case where Alan Moore's political bias got in the way of the story, and in retrospect reveals much more about the guy than even he realizes, because now he's the guy saying millions must die over a situation that never even happened. Making a sequel to this has potential to just rip the wound right open again and end up making the whole story seem pointless and hysterical, which could either be a great critique on fear-mongering and what depths people can sink to if they're convinced they're the savior of the world, or just make the entire package look dumb as hell. Spoiler, it's actually sort of both, because you see, they tried to find a new major political issue to talk about. Now, to deny the political angle of Watchmen is just stupid. I mean, it's a blatantly political story. The issue is not Watchmen 2019 got political, it's that the politics it handles are so basic and childish that it veers straight into half-hearted exploitation. And yes, I do mean exploitation. Because you see, the politics of 2019 Watchmen revolve around racism. That's it. Racism. Nothing else. Just racism. I got a nose for white supremacy and he smells like bleach. And I seriously cannot stress how preachy and in-your-face it is handled. It is the most two-dimensional, childish interpretation they could have went with. It genuinely thinks the audience is stupid, and the way certain elements are talked about dips into full-blown parody. Damon Lindelof really wants to push racism as the focus of the show, even referring to it as the new Cold War, a vague nothing statement to tie the show to the themes of the original story. But before I get ahead of myself, Let's actually explain the concept. So it takes place in modern-day Tulsa, Oklahoma. The local law enforcement suffer an attack by a terrorist organization that kills a number of police officers in a single night. 
the Terror somehow got access to the private information of the entire station, and launched a coordinated attack to cripple the cops in a single move. Because of this, the cops in Tulsa decide to mask up, donning superhero personas and the governor of the state outright pushes a state amendment to the Keene Act, the federal law that outlawed mass vigilantes. So the police are forced to pretend to not be police officers due to a single attack by terrorists. There's a lot wrong with this. Really take two seconds to think about it. The police are forced to become anonymous superheroes because of one terrorist attack. They don't try getting the feds involved, no US Marshals, no National Guard. They didn't take the situation up a level, even after cops were targeted and murdered en masse in their homes in a single night. Not even gonna put in a phone call anywhere. Hell, it gets even more egregious because you find out the FBI is aware of the terror group. They have been watching them for a while, actually. And they just decided to not step in even after an entire state law was passed that forced police in the entire state of Oklahoma to become masked vigilantes completely flaunting the Keen Act? The worst part is that this isn't some small excuse in order to get superhero cops either. They constantly bring attention to the terror attack, what they call the White Knight. It's so bad that numerous lives are ruined and some are full-blown traumatized. Detectives working with the state have to get fucking cover jobs to hide their real jobs as detectives. You know, the job that gives you plenty of free time to have a double life? What about something like paperwork? Do they file reports under their superhero name? Because just fucking try having that stand up in court. The entire concept is a legalistic nightmare that would get eaten alive in a courtroom, even considering the circumstances. If anything, especially because of them. Because the law only applies to Oklahoma. So what if they arrest a suspect that wasn't from the state? They would have to surrender him to whoever had jurisdiction, and if they deem that arrest improper, which is really easy to do when cops are encouraged to hide their identity and beat the shit out of suspects, then you just fucked everyone involved. Let's at least pretend we got a fucking clue. And the frustrating part is they keep trying to say this works. That crime is down and other states are even considering passing the law themselves. Except we're given zero indication this actually works. The terror organization is still rampaging around and they still have plenty of power and resources at hand. We are just told it works and crime is down. Even though really, it would make crime skyrocket the fuck up. The police are on the back foot, they show a level of fear that can't be denied. They have no control over the situation. It would devolve into anarchy with mass cops who will never reveal their identity, beating petty criminals half to death. And the terror group escalates their violence because they have zero reason to push the brakes, the cops are scared. Also, they never explain how the terror group actually got the identity of the police, meaning that's just unresolved. So even if the cops want to be unmasked, they will eventually be outed anyway because there has to be HR people, there has to be logistical people, there has to be people that have to file the goddamn tax paperwork. Someone has to know the actual identities of everyone involved there. Some have even tried to excuse the mask thing by comparing it to actual incidents that happened in Colombia during the height of Pablo Escobar, where law enforcement, even full-blown judges, had to work cases wearing masks to avoid assassinations. This doesn't really work as an excuse for Watchmen, though, because what made the Colombia situation different is the sheer scale of Pablo's reach. It was a legitimate fear he could have judges assassinated because he had tons of cops in his pocket, along with terror groups and even portions of the fucking Colombian military. He was so deeply entrenched that trying to fight him was an uphill battle. With Watchmen, it's purely the terror group versus the Tulsa police. As stated, they never actually address the Oklahoma FBI branch, any National Guard, SWAT, any significant escalation that comes up when a situation blows up into targeted cop killings. Plus, it's very obvious that the terrorists learned the information from insiders they placed in the police department, meaning going masks up solves nothing. There's still spies that have access to their private information. It's not even like they hand wave it away, they just don't talk about it, it never comes up. This is just downright insane because Watchmen as a comic would bring this up. There was a major conflict that sparked up between vigilantes and the police, because specifically guys like Rorschach would execute suspects with no due process. The story wanted to ground superheroes into at least some form of reality. The HBO show having such a flagrant disregard can only come down to laziness. They know that the presence of any larger scale law enforcement would cut the plot short, because they'd easily crack down on the terror group and arrest the collaborators, meaning they just ignore the very idea and make it seem like the cops are trapped with no other options. It's just stupid, plain and simple. Especially when they address that cops need to call for permission to draw their weapon. Requesting firearm lock release. Yes, they literally have to call into the station, report a situation where they feel unsafe, and ask for permission to draw their service weapon. The holster is electronically locked, and only after calling in will the lock release. This is the same setting where cops are being targeted for sport by a terrorist organization. So they're in danger, and nobody's allowed to take their mask off even in the police station where they work, 
but they're not in danger enough to let the cops have agency on whether they can pull their gun or not, it's also completely stupid. And only there because when the show was coming out, this was a popular talking point regarding police shootings, that cops need to ask permission to draw their weapon to prevent civilians from being shot. This is a blatant example of allowing modern Twitter politics to interfere with the story, because this point doesn't belong anywhere near this world. It's clear and cut a contradiction, a plot hole. A plot hole. And in service to, once again, pushing an agonizingly blatant racism message. Racism bad, racism bad, repeat ad nauseum for nine hours straight. Now, racism was addressed in the original comic, but it was treated as just another aspect of human evil. It wasn't the sole thing wrong with the world, it was a symptom of larger decay, because the original comic was all around misanthropic. HBO Watchmen, on the other hand, insists racism is the one true thing killing the world. Except not really. Except yes it does. Except no. It's mealy-mouthed, despite being so sanctimonious. There's multiple moments where there's clearly a much larger plot at play, something that shows how small the racism issue is by comparison, only for them to frantically throw it back into the realm of racism out of fear that they didn't make their pet issue the biggest thing in the world. The show makes references to the Battle of Tulsa, a violent race riot that occurred in the 1920s, but conveniently leaves out all the details of how the riot started, the circumstances around it, like the exchange of gunfire between whites and blacks over an attempted lynching. It even goes so far as to say the KKK was intimately involved, and even had fucking attack planes dropping bombs on people. The actual Tulsa riots were caused when a black man by the name of Dick Rowland was arrested after being accused of sexually assaulting a young white woman named Sarah Page. He entered the same elevator as her. There was a scream and he was reported as running out of it. No one knows what actually happened, but the Tulsa Tribune published an article asserting he assaulted her. This sparked a police response and a group of white citizens arrived at the courthouse he was being held to lynch him. The black neighborhood formed a posse, mostly made up of veterans who returned from World War I to arrive to protect him. An incident occurred and a gunfight between the two sides kicked off. Can 10 whites and two blacks were supposedly killed in this firefight and this snowballed into the white neighborhood forming an angry mob to take revenge on the black neighborhood. This is what sparked off the infamous race riots. It was undeniably motivated by racial tensions, but has since been exploited by various racial activists, and many details are exaggerated to a degree that really calls for a neutral third party to investigate. The details about the attack planes are just rumors. Uh, nothing confirms this was actually a thing, especially since the report regarding the Tulsa riots that came out in 2001 clarified that only six military-grade aircraft were present in the area at the time of the riot, with two inoperable, two having been freshly purchased and not ready to fly yet, and the last two were still on base 212 miles away at Fort Still when the riots kicked off. The only planes that could have been there would have been privately owned. The only possible owners would be the airfield itself, the Curtis Southwest Airplane Company, or the local oil company that was the backbone to the Tulsa economy, St. Clair Oil Company, neither of which would probably appreciate their property being seized for the purpose of being used to murder women and children in a violent race riot. In truth, the police captain at the time, George Blaine, did fly over the black neighborhood during the fomenting of the riots, but it wasn't to drop bombs. It was to check if any armed mobs were forming. There's no evidence any explosives were dropped or guns were fired. Instead, the claims seem to originate from a black newspaper company that wanted to amp up the drama of the riots for the, their readers. They all come from anonymous sources and people recalling stories from relatives. Even though representatives uh, to the NAACP itself were there and not one spoke of attack planes, it simply comes down to exaggeration for the sake of drama, to evoke the imagery of white supremacists gunning down black civilians in attack planes. Also, apparently, the black neighborhood was um, never referred to as the Black Wall Street. It was 
just a regular neighborhood that was was slightly better off than others. Um, the name once again became popular in retrospect to push the idea that the riots were motivated by racial tensions and jealousy instead of uh, the gunfight that happened outside of the courthouse. The Tulsa riots are a tragedy, but there's quite a lot of exaggeration and warped details around it, to the point that even the official report that was drafted in 2001 admits it had trouble finding the truth due to the amount of time and emotional bias around the event. And shows like HBO Watchmen only makes this issue worse, as millions of people will now repeat the details about the planes when there's no proof they were actually used in the riots. On top of painting the mob as just angry white supremacists without ever addressing the arrest of Dick Rowland or the gunfight outside of the courthouse. It wouldn't excuse the actions of the rioters, but it's a shade of nuance taken out of the story for the sake of exploitation and boiling down a complicated situation to its most simplistic for the lowest common denominator. All in service to a show where people dress up in costumes to beat up trailer trash rednecks. Actual people died in this event. And HBO Watchmen merely uses it for lip service. It doesn't actually care about raising awareness, simply wearing the tragedy uh, as a shield against uh, criticism and to pretend it has even the slightest respect for history to appear smarter than it actually is. Sorry for popping up so much in this video, but HBO Watchmen is truly a rabbit hole that gets dumber the more you think about it. There's a lot to clarify. Since Damon Lindelof has no intention on doing it himself. It's so very clearly a Hollywood version of events that exaggerates details for the sake of emotional manipulation. And I know some people might say, well, it is a Hollywoodized alternate history so it can get away with stuff like that. Except it references the Tulsa Massacre over and over and over again. It is a major part of the lore in this show. It's a major motivation for one character. Getting it right and actually explaining it in full with respect should be a priority. It also makes every white character that isn't a major character part of the racist terror group the good guys are fighting. It discusses things like reparations, the idea of paying an affected group money to make up for a tragedy that occurred in the past, and even retcons one of the characters from the original comic to be black. Multiple times, actually. Which is especially ironic in one case, because the guy was, uh, a Nazi who fled Europe and was implied to be a pedophilic child killer. Yeah. Now, the prequel series that establishes all this is called Before Watchmen. And it wasn't written by Alan Moore, it was Darwin Cook. However, the HBO series takes elements from it for hooded justice, such as him being in a homosexual relationship with Captain Metropolis. So they cherry-picked details for the show, unaware of how laughable it all looked. But even the main villains of the show begin and end at racism. The one thing that takes up all the spotlight until the finale of the show, the 7th Calvary. The Calvary is a white supremacist organization supposedly inspired by Rorschach that seeks vengeance on America for what they view as betrayal. Really, their agenda is every Reddit straw man of a Republican all rolled into one group. They don't like people with different skin tones, reparations, and feel like they're beaten down for their race. Also, they're dumb hillbilly country folk who can build a teleporter machine and stay several steps ahead of law enforcement. Yes, they're being manipulated by a sociopathic billionaire, but still, a bunch of dumb hillbillies can avoid tons of cops and build a goddamn teleporter. Yeah, we have to simultaneously believe that the 7th Cavalry are just dumb racists and are smart enough to successfully conspire against the protagonists. Now, the Rorschach inspiration is beyond tenuous, it's non-existent. They're inspired by Rorschach because the showrunners don't like him and want to shame him, so they tie him to a violent white supremacist group. You never get a scene where they definitively connect the Calvary to Rorschach, like ever. They quote his journal, very badly and rewritten to include talking points that became popular on Twitter, overflowing with liberal tears, and they wear his mask, but at no point do they even try to establish what their real ideology actually is. They're just racist, that's it. Reminder, Rorschach was supposed to be kind of racist, but above all else, he was an objectivist. He believed in complete adherence to morality, and wanted to punish evil if he found it. It's such an obvious hit job against the guy that the showrunners had to rush out and explain that Rorschach's journal was misinterpreted by the Calvary, because the guy is an extremely popular character a lot of people identify with, and this twist, which I don't even know if you can call it a twist, blew up in their face really bad. Watchmen is one of the biggest examples of death of the author, 
where fans ignore Alan Moore's intentions because they prefer their own interpretations of the story, and once the reveal was made that the 7th Cavalry were inspired by Rorschach, of course there'd be obvious backlash. Backlash bad enough that the suits and shards freaked out hard enough to break character for a moment, trying to appease the very fans they antagonized in the first place. Which means jack and shit, because it's the only reference to Rorschach in the entire show. And who gives a shit about Rorschach? They can try to clear up whatever they want in interviews, the show by itself says more than enough how they view the character. He's a racist worshipped by other racists. That's what they're saying. They never bring up his investigation into the death of the comedian, his fight to expose Ozymandias, nothing. They use his iconography and that's it, because they want to relate Roshock Mask to racism. The thing is, they missed out on a great opportunity for a twist. I mentioned before that they feel betrayed by the government and want to kill their way to the all-white utopia. The thing is, the betrayal is an actual thing you can point to. You see, it's established that after the events of the comic, Ozymandias actually tried to contact the American president to take credit for the attack, to collude with the US government in order to guide the world towards the utopia he's desperate for. The guy, supposedly the smartest man on the planet, flat out records a confession tape in order to take credit for the attack in New York something that turns the city into a ghost town so bad, they're begging people to return. It's established that it was a move motivated by ego. Ozymandias wants to be hailed as a god like Dr. Manhattan was, so he confessed to his crimes with the hopes of his vision finally being recognized, that he was the savior of humanity instead of a mass murderer. While the cavalry stumbled into the confession tape, they actually do explain how, even if it's contrived, and so they discovered the truth. This is actually the great groundwork for a twist, and also, how they can relate it to another character in the canon without it really being an issue. Instead of it being Roshock, have it be the comedian. The ultra-misanthropic, violent, horrible human being that saw the entire world as one big joke. This would be the ultimate punchline for a cult of this size. That the same government that's trying so hard to appeal to the people and get black people reparations and do all these grand and majestic things is trying to cover up mass murder that they are well aware of and will not punish the one responsible for. They could have shown that the cavalry were broken, traumatized people. They just discovered the truth behind the worst tragedy in recorded history, something that changed the face of the world practically overnight. Aliens weren't real. It was a false flag operation by a megalomaniac, and the government was complicit in it using the tragedy for political gain. Restricting guns, they never actually explain how the Second Amendment was impeded, but they do say it. Even though tons of characters use guns in the show, it, it, it's a right-wing straw man talking point. It, there's no point bringing it up. And passing a highly controversial reparations law, one that was motivated by the Tulsa Massacre. And this feeds into a bit of the exploitation I talked about. Said reparations law has impacted the state, newcomers flooding in to get the free money, while natives of Oklahoma were left out to dry, because it was explicitly giving one race an advantage over another, for a crime that happened nearly 100 years prior, and has nothing to do with the attack on New York. No fucking shit a terror group would spark up. In a just world, Ozymandias and Robert Redford, a parody of Reagan since Robert Redford is also an actor who becomes president in the can of Watchmen, would be hung on national TV for crimes against humanity. You can easily view reparations as a cynical move to get in the good races of the people in case it ever comes out. All the while, the government was doing downright evil things. But it's a brief come-and-go mention. Because once again, reparations were a popular talking point in 2019 when the show was relevant. It's throwing in Twitter politics without understanding how it would actually impact the larger world, since the implication now is the government basically passed the buck of the public's anger onto black people to hide their own fucked up shit. Those who liked the show might come out and say that was intentional, but there's no way on God's green earth it was because they never add nuance to the discussion. The Seventh Cavalry are complete cartoons from beginning to end. In fact, the one episode where it does seem like they're trying to flesh out the Calvary and let the main bad guy explain what they believe in, they have to sabotage it and have him give a literal rebel yell to remind you their only motivation is racism. <laughs> yeah. If anything, they imply that the Calvary stretches much further than Oklahoma, as they are actually the remnants of a group hooded justice fought in the 1940s known as the Cyclops, who are developing mind control technology to make black people riot. This is an actual plot point, they make a film projector that brainwashes black people into rioting. They blame the actual real-life Harlem riots on super-secret racist mind control. This show is apparently one of the greatest of all time, don't you know? Also, the mind control plot goes nowhere, it shows up twice, then vanishes into the actual main story. This happens a lot, plot points are picked up and dropped as though they're writing episode by episode, even though there's clear cases of reincorporation. It's clearly meant to be a bait for later seasons, not quite full of J.J. Abrams' mystery box, but a similar concept. They even tease a guy covered in lube who shows up for 5 seconds, then vanishes for the rest of the show. He's pointless, because he was meant to be explained later, but the show died before they could. Now the big thing I want to talk about is the wasted potential. There's elements that are legitimately good, and if they had a better staff of writers at the helm, they could have actually lived up to Watchmen's legacy. 
The acting is pretty great all around, the standouts being Don Johnson as his chief of police and Tim Blake Nelson as Looking Glass. Two are fantastic actors, two of my personal favorite, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting. Another great performance to mention is Louis Gossett Jr. as Will Reeves. The guy was able to perfectly ride the line between unsuspecting old man and clearly knowing far more than he's willing to say. I much prefer him to his flashback version, who felt very stale. He just couldn't go in any direction that made him stand out. Old Man Will is much more interesting with his performance. Now, the actual protagonist is Regina King as Angela Abar, and she feels downright fucked over. Angela doesn't really have much of a distinct personality, she's whatever the scene needs her to be. In her daily life, she's a kind mom and loving wife. As a superhero, she's a bitter, no-nonsense vigilante that's willing to torture suspects to get what she wants. And the thing is, you never actually feel a difference between the two, she's just black cop lady, a weaker version of Kima from The Wire. And it especially sucks because the entire mystery revolves around her and her family, which makes it very hard to keep invested, since her chunk of the story is very dull and you can guess it from a mile away once the basic setup is given. As soon as they bring up Hooded Justice, you already know that Will is him, and that he is her family. You'll not be able to guess the exacts, but it all takes some simple math in your head to make it match. Young boy in the 20s, old man in the present day, natural to assume they are the same person. They keep trying to tease it as being part of a larger mystery, but as stated, the mystery is very easy to guess once you see the pieces, so you're waiting on reveals you already see coming. The only real twists they have are thanks to situations they don't tell you about until minutes before the twist. So it's not even really foreshadowed, they just suddenly establish something as being possible and then rush to confirm it. The episode that discusses Hooded Justice for the first time also confirms he's black. And from there, the natural thing to assume is that it's somehow related to Angela, because of course he is. They even go so far as to say he was the first of the Minutemen, childish pandering that once again establishes a full-blown KKK-inspired racist as a black icon. In case you want to say, well, they toned him down for the movie, so maybe they go with the movie version? No, the show is using the comics continuity. The only excuse they have for this is that they know nobody will read the comic, and the media talking about the heroes is full of inaccuracies, i.e. they wreck on the shit out of them. The only character who had an arc I cared about was Looking Glass. He's actually a survivor of Ozymandias' plot since he was there in New Jersey when the squid was summoned. Ever since then, he's been traumatized, living in a fallout shelter, and wearing a reflective tape around his head, since it supposedly wards off psychic energy. He has a major moment in Episode 5 where he discovers the truth behind the attack and is completely rattled. He has an entire crisis where he doesn't even know what the truth is anymore and if there's even a point to investigating the Calvary. It's really interesting. A lot of what makes him good is Tim Blake Nelson's performance. The guy is able to exude a lot of personality into Looking Glass, and his verbose, southern charm bleeds through. He seems like a dumb redneck at first glance, but a single conversation shows that he is very well-spoken, and actually the smartest guy in the room. You're fucking weird. And you are adequately self-aware to recognize the hypocrisy of that remark. He feels like almost a spiritual successor to Roshock, a mentally disturbed man that just wants to uncover the truth and punish evil. There's more to him than just that. He is substantially more healthy than Roshock ever was, but the similarities are there. They even have a similar gimmick with their masks. Roshock had the, well, Roshock test, and Looking Glass has a reflective mask. Both warp around the person looking at them, one symbolically, the other literally. There's even what appears to be a subtle nod to Rorschach in the show, where Looking Glass is eating green beans straight from the can, much like how Rorschach raids Night Owl's cupboards for beans that he eats raw in the original series. His arc is genuinely interesting because it has the most to do with the events of the story. Angela is only thrown in at the very end when Dr. Manhattan gets involved. Other than that, it's only really about the history of her family. And quite frankly, who fucking cares? Yeah, it's tied in with the one major spoiler that's at the end of the first episode, but that's one of those moments where uh, that plot beat is completely dropped and does not matter in the long term, like, at all. But Looking Glass, from the get-go, clearly has something wrong with him. So when it's revealed he's a survivor from New York, it works as a satisfying revelation to his character. A tad convenient? You can argue that, but it's used effectively. Episode 5 all around is easily the best one, since it actually teased a deeper lore to the 7th Cavalry that I was wanting. Playing with the idea that who they are on paper isn't anywhere close to who they actually were in reality. I was legitimately excited for the idea that the government faked a white supremacist group as a cover for their shenanigans in Tulsa, since it screamed that it was going in that direction. We even rigged the lettuce to fall off the damn truck. Showing that the Calvary had a level of coordination and resources that was simply impossible to expect from dumb trailer trash. 
and was even sort of foreshadowed with how the 7th Cavalry had suicide pills to use in case of capture and outright military-grade weapons, like a full-blown 50 caliber machine gun and even planes to use for escapes. There's very obviously something much deeper going on, and they want people to think they're just dumb rednecks so they can be underestimated. Wouldn't that be interesting? Doesn't that sound like that could be legitimately clever? Well, too bad, because they chicken the fuck out first chance they get. They have the main bad guy revealed to be the state senator explain their entire plan and motivation in a victory speech, talking about how the president betrayed them, and then quickly changing the point to every Reddit talking point about Republicans you can think of, because, you know, you can't even tease the idea that maybe the white supremacist terror organization might actually have a point or two about, yeah, maybe the government did betray America. It's also revealed that the main bad guy isn't the main bad guy. It's actually a billionaire sociopathic chick that wants to kill Dr. Manhattan and steal his power and give it to herself, which is, uh, I'll get, I'll get into that later, but, uh, that was another element that really does make, it, it doesn't make any sense. Back on point, it's even revealed that Don Johnson was in league with the cavalry. Yes, the police chief that is murdered at the end of the first episode. Spoilers, but who gives a fuck, don't watch this. He even worked as an insider that gave the group information. Oh, so is he responsible for the White Knight? He got a bunch of cops killed and for some reason pushed the mask thing? Maybe to humiliate the police and set them up in no-win situations because the mask idea is idiotic? No. He was put in place because the White Knight went too far and the cavalry went to remain discreet. Even though the guy was already the chief of police by the time the White Knight happened and already had a pretty stellar reputation, meaning that he would have had to have been there for a while and you can logically assume he was the one that gave the cavalry the information to kick off the White Knight in the first place, which at that point, the mask thing doesn't fucking work because he already knows who everyone's identity is and he knows they're still actively working for the Tulsa police. 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, by the way. Instead, the mask thing was pushed as a compromise and to confuse who the good and bad guys were. Senator Joe used them to kill a bunch of police so that he could put all the cops in masks. And pretty soon, no one can tell the good guys from the bad guys. What? What the hell does that mean? No, I'm not kidding. This is not performative outrage. What does that mean? People can very obviously tell the difference between a cavalry member and a cop, and there are shitloads of cavalry members all over the place, in every position of power in the state of Oklahoma. The implication is that the state sander would have the cavalry infiltrate the police force, so it's the same organization pretending to fight and boosting up his career in the process. The thing is, you don't need to pass a whole ass amendment to do that. You had guys able to organize an entire mass assassination of police officers in a single night. This is neglecting the fact that they already had people that infiltrated the fucking police. Don Johnson was literally put there as a plant. There is no point to the mask thing because it took Angela having to investigate his life post his death in order to find out he was tied to the cavalry. They had names, addresses, relatives, all the information they would ever need to win a war against the cops. They very clearly had people working in the police department that could give them that information. Why would they need cops to be in masks? Why would they need them to be a mask to infiltrate them? They already showed in the flashback about Hood to Justice in the 40s that, yeah, members of the ultra-secret cult that became the Calvary in the modern day did in fact already infiltrate the police force, and they were pretty open about it because nobody could really do anything to stop them. You know what the truth is behind the whole why would they need to be in mask question? The answer is they don't and they lucked the fuck out with the feds not barging in and rooting out the Calvary once people started dying en masse, because they established that the feds are of a, uh, different political persuasion. We all know how accommodating white folks are when people of color dare to prosper. It's especially ironic because the FBI in real life... Yeah, so the feds have no respect for the Calvary. So why didn't they get involved after the White Knight? It was a terror organization performing major acts of violence against law enforcement. To the point the entire city was forced to make police officers anonymous, and they had to tack on an amendment to the Keene Act. It's an idiotic plan that only exists so they can have the cops as superheroes gimmick. The only real answer to the Fed question in the show is they had the FBI perform one meeting about it to talk about it and wave away the presence of Rorschach and then send Silk Spectre, who now works for the FBI, down to Oklahoma to see what's going on, her alone with a single partner to back her up. Despite them confirming the presence of a really, really, really powerful white supremacist gang that could pull off a mass assassination of political targets. Yeah, that, that's bullshit. That's complete bullshit. And another thing that's really, really annoying about the Silk Spectre thing, beyond it being a very hollow attempt at fan service where they're just dragging in one of the old heroes, uh, by the way, you never get to see Night Owl again or uh, anything like that, is they imply that she decided to take on the mantle of her father, the comedian, the man she fucking hated because he was a horrible asshole that pretty much embodied the worst parts of mankind. 
She never respected her father. She never liked him. Learning what actually happened between him and her mother broke her emotionally. The entire reason that Dr. Manhattan decided to come back to Earth was the revelation of the comedian being her father was such an astronomical impossibility he never even considered it. So it was enough of a shock to show that the future is not permanent and maybe he could change things and get involved with mankind again. I mean, it's that big of a deal. But once again, Silk Spectre never liked him. Just because she knew who he was doesn't mean that she accepted him. But yeah, the point is, she's implied to want to take on the mantle of the comedian. She talks a lot like him, talking about bad jokes that pops into her mind, laughing at things she finds absurd. It's very obviously she's trying to be like the comedian. Now, they don't go full-blown with it. She doesn't call herself the comedian. It's more of like she's just taking on a lot of the same mannerisms. And they're trying to make her kind of like a snarky shit talker, which doesn't always work, but I definitely will say she's one of the better characters just out of the fact that she's not boring. Now, OG Watchmen never struggled with the plot holes I just talked about. Superheroes were cops who beat the shit out of criminals that also dressed up so they couldn't be identified. Then just sort of evolved into a pop culture icon that spawned stuff like the Minutemen. Then, when Dr. Manhattan showed up, everything was chucked into overdrive. Sure, the heroes had secret identities, but they were cops on top of that. It wasn't a formal job that required personal information. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was something they did on their off time to go after suspects that due process didn't work on, like Mafia guys. They address that being a vigilante completely works against the ideas of being a police officer. I remind you, who watches The Watchmen? There were entire riots about it in the original comic. Hell, to bring it back to Hooded Justice again, the show tries to paint him as the only honest cop in the department. He's the one man trying to fight off the actual cult that's operating in the city that's slowly weaseling their way into positions of power. But in the comic, they establish he only became a vigilante due to him having a sexual fixation on hurting people. He got off on it. It wasn't altruism. He became a hero for the worst reasons possible, which is a running element in the comic. It's been nearly an hour at this point, and you can see how this just spirals into gripe after gripe. It's just annoying and mindless, which for a comic that had a ton of detail put into it is pretty egregious. One of the most infamous scenes that I will mention in the entire show is the funeral. So after Don Johnson's character is killed off, they hold a funeral for him. Well, that funeral is interrupted by one of the members of the Calvary who's wearing a suicide vest. He grabs the state senator and swears he will explode if they try to kill him or get his finger off the trigger. It's a dead man switch. Well, this was the same episode that Silk Spectre comes back, and she doesn't give a fuck. She shoots him in the head thinking it's all bluff. Well, this allows Regina King's character to have enough time to get everyone evacuated, grab onto the dead Calvary member who just undid the dead man switch on his explosive, the thing that activates the goddamn bomb, push him slowly over to the grave, chuck him into it, and then toss the coffin with her boss's body into it on top of it, allowing it to explode, destroying the coffin and the corpse at his funeral to save the day, quote-unquote, even the guy was already dead and everyone was already running for the hills. Then you later find out, in I think maybe the scene right after that, that the FBI was planning on exhuming the police chief to make sure he actually died the way the reports say he died. We were literally going to dig him up tomorrow. So Regina King's character did that entire dumbass action thing she didn't need to do and destroyed evidence in the process. I repeat to you, this is something the comic would bring up and she would get in a lot of trouble for. The entire point is that reality does not work like superhero comics. HBO Watchmen feels the opposite, where they're taking Watchmen and forcing it to work off comic book logic. This is on top of the fact that it's later revealed that this attack was completely pointless. The governor was in league with the Calvary. If the bomb went off, their ringleader would have died. Along with the fact that there's no way they could have predicted that Regina King would have used the explosive to destroy the chief of police's corpse, which they didn't need to do anyway since he was killed by a third party. If anything, they would have wanted him intact to track down his killer. As he was the mole working in the police for them, there's no reason this would happen except to make the governor look good, which is extremely risky as they used a real bomb that actually could have gone off at any point. And don't want to get me started on how they handled Dr. Manhattan, the guy that is an actual omniscient god that the entire point is, he's the only one with superpowers and has changed the face of the world by his mere existence. That guy is constantly outsmarted by other people, constantly has to be told to do other things, and then even decides to wipe his own memory for no real reason beyond getting with the chick he just met, even though he's done this dance twice already. And I do feel bad because I think the actor that plays him isn't the worst. It's mainly that the direction is uh, not great, 
they keep trying to get him to do just monotone voice, which, yeah, that is Dr. Manhattan, he's not very expressive, but he just doesn't hit that haunting level of almost eldritch being that the actor in the movie did. Billy Crudup's performance as Dr. Manhattan in the film was very well done. You know about me and Dan? Not yet. But in a few moments, you're going to tell me. He understood all the little subtleties that made the character interesting. How he can sound so monotone, yet know so much at the same time. It truly feels like he is just a puppet going through the motions. There's not really any emotion or opinion put into it. Which is something that I feel like the guy in the show fucked up. Yaya Abdul-Mateen really didn't do as bad of a job as you might think, especially with how his makeup looks. Because that is something where he was just explicitly fucked over. The look of Dr. Manhattan was ridiculous. But it's the fact that the writing around him, they didn't understand that Dr. Manhattan is quite literally above humanity. There is nothing they can do to surprise him. He is well and truly a god. But they constantly have these moments where he's allowed to be manipulated or outsmarted by characters, and the only real excuse they have is, well, he decided to wipe his memories to be with the main chick. Even though this raises a plot hole of, well, the Manhattan we're seeing in the show is just one of many. There's one on Mars that's basically just going through a preordained list of tasks. But that's not like a ghost or shadow clone jutsu he made up. That is a Manhattan. Manhattan is a god. He can split himself off and go into all sorts of different galaxies all at once. He exists in every single point of time. So the idea that one can die and that's the only Manhattan that can die, because yes, they do kill off Dr. Manhattan, is ridiculous. And they broke the rules of the story to get the ending they wanted. You can argue the same thing happened in the original comic where Manhattan decides to go along with the genocide plan instead of trying to, I don't know, destroy all nuclear weapons across the world forever, because he can absolutely do that. But I actually view that as a legitimate point of contention against Dr. Manhattan as a character. The story brings up a lot of moments where he could have done something to help somebody, and he just didn't. He didn't care to. The comedian outright rips his ass for it over an instant in Vietnam, where he shoots a woman dead right in front of Dr. Manhattan, and he didn't do anything to stop it. You could have turned the gun into steam, the bullets into mercury, the, the bottle into goddamn snowflakes, but you didn't, did you? The character is interesting in the comic because even though he has so much power, he views himself as just kind of a vessel of fate. He's not going to try to change anything because that's not the future he saw. And it makes it interesting where you have these debates back and forth between characters that are willing to call him out for it, and people who agree with him and are terrified to say anything against him. Which makes the whole subplot with the billionaire chick all the more laughable. Yeah, you find out she's the daughter of Ozymandias. Spoilers. And the way that she is created is, uh, ridiculous. But she's a case where she's just repeating a trend that, well, Ozymandias himself already went through, which is she thinks she can outsmart Dr. Manhattan. Now, in the original comic and the movie, they bring up the fact that nothing Adrian could ever do could actually touch him. You know, the world's smartest man is the same to Dr. Manhattan as the world's smartest termite. It means nothing to him. So revealing this chick as the mastermind who's been conspiring a way to kill Dr. Manhattan as revenge for her father is stupid. It's really, really stupid, and basically just has to rely on trust me it works, which is the exact same thing as the superheroes with masks thing. We're not operating in a world running off comic book logic, we're operating on a world that's specifically calling out comic book logic and saying that doesn't work. Dr. Manhattan being the exception breaks reality multiple times. Now the obvious point to bring up is, well, they were probably going to explain a lot of these plot holes in a season 2, yeah, season two, the thing that isn't happening because it got cancelled. And as it is now, it just feels half thought out and downright exploitative. Yeah, I'm gonna call it that. Exploitation. Racism is never actually explored. They just show white people being racist and then finger wag about it. It's not saying anything. It's not showing how someone could become racist, how to break somebody out of being racist. They just assume that you're on board with every single white person in a town being racist. To a degree, that doesn't even make much sense, because John Johnson guy is revealed to be a white supremacist, yet he's willing to be actual friends with Regina King's character. What, was it like a deep cover-up? Did he have to wash his hands anytime he ate dinner at their house? It's, it's fucking ridiculous and childish. Here's the lead writer of the show, by the way. Take note of his melanin levels, it's important for later. Yeah, it's hollow self-flagellation. That's the issue with propping this up as a black power thing. It feels condescending. As though Damon Lindelof would really like to call up somebody a slur, but keeps it balled up inside and unleashes it in Watchmen. It just feels spiteful to everyone. From whites, to blacks, to fans of Watchmen. Every time they mention the giant squid attack, it feels gratuitous. Not like the violence was grisly or anything like that, it feels downright mocking. Like, they want you to think the idea is stupid. They really want you to understand a giant squid attack New York. A giant alien squid to stave off nuclear holocaust. 
They even go so far as to rewrite the alternate history, instead of making Schindler's List a movie about the fucking Holocaust, something that still canonically happened in Watchmen lore, Steven Spielberg made Pale Horse. That's Pale Rider. There's this one scene with this little girl in a red coat. The movie's black and white, so the red really pops, you know? A movie very blatantly meant to be this universe's equivalent to Schindler's List. The movie was in black and white because the story took place in the 1940s, you absolute hack buffoon. Yes, HBO Watchmen changed history to have it be Steven Spielberg makes a movie about a giant squid attack in New York instead of Schindler's List. Something about this feels extremely patronizing. You might argue it's clever world building, but I argue this is the same show that blamed actual race riots on the KKK mind control programs. This feels like a troll, on every level. Damon Lindelof tricked a bunch of people into praising a show made to be a middle finger to everyone who watched it. And honestly, it's not that unlikely considering how he acted in some of the press material, typing out a whole statement once the show aired referring to himself as the guy who's ruining that thing you love, even writing a letter to Alan Moore that directly says, haha, I'm ruining your franchise. Now despite that actually being kind of based, fuck you, Alan, this shows exactly the mindset Lindelof had with making this show. It's an arrogant prick gleefully writing over a beloved classic, throwing in half-digested plot points and surface-level political commentary. And for what? To make a show that died after a single season. Hope it was worth it. Now, don't think we're signing off just yet. I do want to talk about something. I mentioned before that I intentionally put off making this video, and there is a reason for that. Lately, there's been too much of an obsession with hate-watching, watching a piece of media ironically for the sake of tearing it apart, even if you already know you're gonna hate what you're seeing. There's tons of channels that do this, and pretty much everyone is on the hunt for the next so bad it's good thing. The issue I have with this mentality is that it leads to situations where people feel obligated to watch stuff they know will be a piece of shit. Now, obviously, there's the difference between, like, a Tommy Wiseau or a Neil Breen and something like a 2019 Watchmen. Obviously, 2019 Watchmen has legitimate talent put into it. The cinematography is really well done. They have a lot of creative segments where it goes from black and white to fading into color. They had an entire 1930s silent film tribute to Bass Reeves in an old western. That was really interesting. There's heart and soul that's put into this, and that pisses me off. That's not to say that everyone should only ever praise what they're discussing. In fact, it is the opposite. It. You should be very critical. The problem is that it still ends with you feeding the beast you hate, even when you think you're doing it ironically. Look at how many people dread the premiere of a new Star Wars show, as though they have to watch it, even if they're burned out beyond belief. Or hell, look at Barbie. So many people went into that movie wanting to hate it. They were open about how not excited they were and only expected the worst, but acted like they needed to go see it to be part of the zeitgeist. Of course, then it became sort of an ironic gem among some crowds, but I'm convinced that's because everyone just sees what they want to see in the movie, regardless of the actual intended messaging, and also everyone loves Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Now, this isn't about Barbie itself as a movie. Some people like it, some people hate it. The point is that people felt as if they needed to watch it. Fear of missing out, fueling an artificial small-scale panic in your customers to drop money on your product so they don't feel left out. That's what I think is behind a lot of this, and doubly so when you consider how YouTube is all about chasing trendy topics in order to maximize your position in the algorithm. Personally though, I really hate the hate-watching mentality. Like this meme here, this one, the Peaky Blinders edit where Silly Murphy is screaming at people not to hate-watch, I curl my lip any time I see this. Yeah, it's just a dumb meme, but it represents the issue to a T. People have to be told not to hate-watch, to not intentionally chase anger because it will fuel the very thing that makes them miserable. They can show open contempt towards whatever they're working on, outright call the fans dumb racists, or dumb minorities who need to be told they were brainwashed by the KKK to cause riots, and they can get away with it. There's too much safety among Hollywood circles. Yeah, the recent strike put some fear into the writers and studios, but it's a small drop in the bucket. And that was mostly over AI and residuals, not about what I'm talking about here. Rage baiting is very much a thing. This idea didn't just pop up in some producer's head, they had to have learned it from somewhere. And the truth is, rage baiting can work. There's that classic phrase, any attention is good attention, and I do believe producers have taken that to heart, and now think if they just prod people with a stick, they'll watch it regardless. Because instead of learning how to pirate, you'll jump straight to Amazon or Netflix or Hulu, wherever you go to watch, and you'll sit down to check something out even if it's ironically, which feeds into the numbers and algorithms these studios look at to see if they want to continue something or not. Big Mouth has seven seasons. Maybe once Netflix is forced to reveal their true numbers, we might see some change on what exactly actually became a success and what's been artificially pushed. But I don't know. All I do know is I held off as long as possible, specifically because I did not want to act like free advertising for this piece of shit. 
Because even if I tell people not to watch it, that's miserable and missed potential in a way that just hurts, someone will check it out out of morbid curiosity. And at that point, I feel guilty. I feel like I contributed to assholes like Lindelof and his ilk, weaseling their way into projects they couldn't give two shits about and ruining them for childish amusement. Yes, it's important to call out bad media when you see it, but that's the problem. They are very capable of making something good. As stated, the technical elements to HBO Watchmen are very well done. They choose not to. They choose to fill the scripts with nonsense, use the actors as basically shields for their bullshit, and we let them get away with it. One of the episodes is literally titled, Don't Like My Story, Then Write Your Own. Because we fall for the bait, and we just don't leave them to starve. They don't care if you love it or hate it, because you saw it regardless. And I hate that. I really, really do. Sure, HBO Watchmen won a bunch of awards and got good review scores, but what it represents actively harms art. Yeah, it was cancelled as soon as the first season ended, and it came out that Rotten Tomatoes has been giving good scores to whoever paid them. Yes, that is an actual thing, please look that up. But the mindset's not gone away. One Piece, there's tons of stories coming out where Oda tore his fucking hair out, demanding Netflix not make a bunch of stupid changes to his manga that they wanted to adapt into live action. They just refuse to let go of this mindset that, for some reason, they can do it better. They can do it better, and what you liked always sucked. All I can say about HBO Watchmen is, it's bad. It's not fun. Don't fall for antagonism. Don't fall into this mindset that you only want to see bad media be bashed. There's plenty of good media out there. Gareth Edwards just made The Creator, which is a very creative, interesting movie about science fiction stuff with robots, and it's basically if Blade Runner took place in Cambodia. Very interesting film, with unique visuals and art direction. I highly recommend it. Story's not perfect, but at least there's heart and soul put into the movie. It doesn't feel like it actively hates you for wanting to watch it. Don't rot your mind with this mindless crap that only exists to antagonize you. The only people who defend it are people who have to suck down a dog turd with a smile on their face and tears in their eyes. They know it's bad, but they feel like they don't have a choice. There's so many different shows and movies out there that, really, this should be just left to the aether. Don't waste your time. Until next time, please remember like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. Let me ask you something. If the rule you followed, Roger of this, of what use was the rule? Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.